Two of the devil's biggest lies are you, you're the only one who struggles with this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and you can't tell anyone. Yeah. And, and sin thrives in that kind of dark secrecy. Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. It is always good to have with me my friend Sam Alberry. Many of you are very familiar with uh, Sam's work. He's a pastor and apologist. He writes a lot, speaks a lot. He's the author of uh, such books as Is God Anti-Gay? What God Has to Say About Our Bodies, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With, and Seven Myths About Singleness. And he's got a new book that has just come out that I think you're going to find really uh, interesting. It's called One With My Lord, The Life-Changing Reality of Being in Christ. Sam and I are at the same church, Emmanuel Nashville, here. And uh, Sam, of course, uh, was in the United Kingdom for most of his life and is now a Nashvillian too. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. I'm wondering, before we talk about the book, there's been a lot of conversation about the new book that has come out by Richard Hayes and and Daniel Hayes. For those of you who are not familiar with this book, Richard Hayes was is one of the preeminent biblical scholars in in the American Christian world and he had written a book called The Moral Vision of the New Testament that's been cited by a lot of people when it comes to sexual ethics. A he now says no, that he's changed his mind and that uh, he now embraces same-sex marriage and redefinition of what the church ought to consider to be uh, marriage. And I'm just wondering, Sam, when you, I know you haven't read the book yet, but what do you think of the argument that's being made there, which is essentially that God changes and we see that with God, with kind of the, throughout the Bible, you have this ever opening and and uh, uh, an embrace of those who are outside of the boundaries, inside of the boundaries, Gentiles, so forth. And that that's what, uh, that that's what's happening now. What, what do you think of that argument? Yeah, I, I don't find it very compelling. I, I think there are two things I always want to hold together. One is, is our doctrine of God is that he is unchanging and I, it would be hard to have confidence in a God who is who's learning on the job and having to course correct himself. But the, the second thing is we do believe in progressive revelation. So we do see throughout the course of the Bible that some things do change. There are some biblical trajectories, but none of them are trajectories where, you know, sexual ethics are kind of if if anything, that the, the Old Testament to New Testament sexual ethic trajectory is one of intensification. Mm. When Jesus picks up Old Testament texts on sexual ethics, such as the prohibition against adultery, he doesn't he doesn't loosen it; he tightens it, and he he applies it to the to the the level of our feelings. If you look at someone with lustful intent, you've committed adultery. So he he actually intensifies it. So of all the things that do sort of sh- shift around as as the as the Bible unfolds, as we move from a, an Old Testament old covenant to a new covenant, there are some things that do change. The food laws change. We see that explicitly noted in the New Testament. We don't see anything that sets up the kind of change that Hayes is arguing for, and nor do we see the kind of changes where we're left to sort of put the pieces together and figure it out. The New Testament is good at signaling. For example, Jesus declaring all foods clean in, in Mark chapter 7. So where there is something that is, has shifted from Old Covenant to New Covenant, that's very clearly marked. Uh, we don't have to try to put all the pieces together ourselves. So what about people who would say, well, Jesus never spoke about these issues of sexual orientation, gender identity at all, and so therefore 
perhaps what's happening in some of some of the passages that we see in the New Testament is a cultural accommodation to the scandal of the the atmosphere of the Roman Empire, but it's not something that's that's binding on the way of Jesus himself. Well, we want to set Jesus within the context in which he was teaching, and we we can see how the New Testament sexual ethic is would have been revolutionary in a first century Greco-Roman context. But that doesn't mean Jesus himself is constrained by the cultural context or that his teaching is only applicable to that setting and not applicable to ours. Jesus has given us enough to know what to think, even on some of the specifics that are unique to our age. So no, there wasn't, to my knowledge, conversations about gender identity in the ancient world, ancient Jewish world, in the way that we're having them. But we know from what Jesus did say, he affirmed that we are created male and female, that that's a physical embodied category. It's not psychologically perceived, but but biologically grounded. That it is a pairing, it's not a, a spectrum, it's not an endless number of, of options for gender identity. So from the things he did say, we can know what to think about some of the issues that are, are unique to our time. You've written a lot about this, and uh, I, I can't help but think about a, uh, a gay atheist I know who was talking about the Hayes book, and he said, it's, it's really hard for me to believe that God would create an ordinance, creation ordinance such as marriage, that he says it is not good for the man to be alone, and then leave this person said, him in the situation where he was to experience the loss of that and, and the inability to to have that. And he talked about mm. his own relationship and his own marriage. And why would God do that? Mm. How, how, how would you, I mean, obviously for him, the, the bigger question is, and this is what I, I said, the, the much bigger question is, is it true? Did Jesus actually yeah. rise from the dead? And then we kind of work uh, backward from there. But but that was a, a sincere question. Hmm. And I wonder how you would answer that. Yeah, it's a very understandable question and, and obviously a very heartfelt one for a lot of people. There's a few things that we need to, to, to keep in our minds. One is that it isn't good for us to be alone. We're created by a God who is himself relationship. Part of how we image him is, is how we relate closely and, and deeply with other people. Marriage is, is not the only way we solve the issue of not being alone. It, is, it might be the normative way, it might be, it might be the premier way, but actually there's lots of other ways we, we, we find ourselves relating healthily to other people. The Bible has a much wider category of, of intimacy than we do. We tend to hear the word intimacy and, and think immediately of romantic intimacy, but the Bible shows us friendship as being a deeply intimate category of relationship. It's a soul-to-soul -soul thing. We see that reflected in the life of Jesus. It's not good for the man to be alone. Jesus was was so deeply relationally embedded as a man who was unmarried. So the principle is true. It's not good for the man to be alone. Marriage is not the only way we we resolve that issue. And even married people need friends as well. So yeah. it's it's easy for for married people to be lonely. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I wanted to talk about this later because you you talk about in the book loneliness and about. Uh, union with Christ, uh, answering some of these longings. So I want, I want to get back to that. But while you're mentioning it now, why do you think it is that so many people have such trouble right now finding friends and finding friendships? I mean, there, there, there are many, many, many people who will say to me, when it's just us in the room, and they're saying, look, I'm in a situation where I'm I have acquaintances, but I don't have friends, and I'm very lonely, and what do I do? Why is that happening so much? Are you having the same sort of conversation with people, or is it just me? As a pastor, barely a week goes by where I don't have conversations like that, often many times in a given week. There are, there are lots of reasons for it. The, the two biggest ones that I think come to my mind are, are firstly, the, the social media smartphone era in which we find ourselves that mm. that actually leads us more to screen-based ways of relating than physical ways of relating. 
And then the pandemic, where depending on where we were and how shut down things were, a lot of social muscles atrophied over the course of 18 months or two years. So I've I've noticed in certainly in local church ministry that when 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, when when new people arrived, one of the first one of the first questions was, do you guys have small groups? How can I how can I get into a small group? Recognizing they want to plug in, they want to get to know people. I it's unusual now for me to hear that question from a newcomer because there's much more social anxiety. And a newcomer doesn't want to be put into a group of strangers they don't know if they're going to feel good with and you're going to be in someone's home and it's that's too that's too much and then and you can't leave people. yeah yeah <laughs> because because once you're there it's kind of awkward to say i'm really not vibing with you all i need to go yeah it feels like a big risk and so one of the things i've we've talked about this as a, as a church leadership team here is people need help on how to make friends in a way they didn't 10 or 15 years ago what would have been relational common sense 15 years ago now is is just not we can't assume it so i find myself i'm i'm planning a, a series of talks on on friendship i was originally going to do two or three weeks on it i'm realizing we probably need to do five six seven weeks on it because there's so much to talk about and people need that people need practical help on how to get to know other people i was just at a a college a couple of hours from here at the weekend talking to a group of college students and lots of questions about overcoming social anxiety how mm-hmm. you how you get to know someone how when is it safe to reveal things about yourself and social media and and so much else in our culture has trained us to think of friendship in a very me-centered way am i being am i being attended to by other people rather than an other person centered way of am i being a good friend to other people so one of the question one of the discussions i often have now with with younger people who are talking about loneliness in the church is they're expecting everyone to to sort of make them first move towards them and to to look to their relational needs but without necessarily thinking of the other people themselves i was talking to a, a younger christian brother recently and and was trying to say to him you're expecting a level of friendship from others that you're not actually giving to others uh, it's a very asymmetrical thing. And I think that's part of where we are culturally. And the key to healthy friendship is self-forgetfulness. The more we can, in Philippians 2 language, consider others before ourselves, the better friend we will be. And actually, we find our relational, our, our emotional needs increasingly being met as we give of ourselves to others. Whereas if our only fa- focus is, are you being there enough for me, makes it harder for people to, to be our friend. Mm-hmm. So, John Lennox, who you may may well know of, many mm-hmm. years ago, I remember him saying, "This is probably twenty years ago plus." Now he said, "What makes someone interesting is that they're interested, mm-hmm. and if you're if you're someone who's interested in others, you are an interesting person to be around." And things like that, we actually have to to really sit down and ex- explain now because the screen does everything for you; you don't have to do anything. Real life people, that that's not the case. You know, you mentioned uh, screens. If I remember right, I don't go on there very much anymore. But what used to be Twitter, X, it seems as though you either shut your account down or, or maybe took an extended break from that. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, I shut it down almost a year ago. Was that a good idea? Yes, I'm not, it won't, I'm not saying everyone has to do it, but it was great for me to do that. It was just, yeah, it was, it was affecting my mental health and... Uh, there were fewer upsides to being there and, and just more and more downsides to being there. Well, I totally agree. And that's one of the reasons why I, I found myself not completely shutting it down, but not on there very much. Well, how how was it affecting your mental health? I think there are a lot of people who they kind of generally know that school that the the sort of uh, social media intake that they're taking isn't good for them, but I mean, as you said, there's not a rule that says, well, you should shut down all of your accounts. And obviously, I mean, you haven't Mm -hmm. shut down all your accounts. So they're not really sure how it's affecting them. How did Mm -hmm. you find it affecting you? I I can tell you in in my case, what happened was I was, I I never read at replies because I only Mm -hmm. can see people that I follow. 
but you still would have it seemed increasingly kind of these really hostile, antagonistic, not necessarily toward me, but mm. just toward the world that was in there that caused me to have a really gloomy view of reality for a while yeah. till I took a break for it, from it and I found out I so liked not being constantly tethered to it that I, that I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't missing anything. So, yeah. uh, what about what about for you? For me, it was two things. It was the whether I always saw it or not. People could at me because I did have an account. Yeah, and I just didn't want to. I there were certain things that people were saying that I needed to reply to because they were having implications for my my own church family here, and I wanted to vindicate my own church family. Mm -hmm. But it's just exhausting. And that the kind of person who is, who lives and thrives on stirring things up, there's, there's no, I don't think there's a constructive way to engage. I mean, that's why the Bible tells us to sort of step back from such people. So that was one thing, just the, the futility of trying to engage and thinking, well, certain things do need to be replied to, otherwise a false narrative just persists. And the second thing was the the algorithm just is constantly throwing into your feed stress, antagonism, conflict, all these different people are arguing with each other. And, so and used, you start to think that those arguments actually matter a lot more yeah. than they do. Yeah, you assume that the moment you leave your front door, you're just going to be seeing people arguing in the streets and you know everywhere around you. So it was just, that was just making me tense. Even if it wasn't about me or, or my world, it was just everyone's angry with everybody else all the time. Yeah, I, was, I went to the, the dentist last week and... She had a, a TV in, on the wall, and it was it was showing the uh, is it the Great British Baking Show or whatever you call it over here. It's something different in the UK. And I was just enjoying. Do they just it. call saying, it the Great Baking Show? <laughs> you can't uh, hear it. I think we call it Bake Off. I think. Oh, okay. But I said, oh, I said, interesting that a dentist has a has a cake themed TV show on. And she said, well, I used to have the news on, but it kept just stressing out my patients. Yeah. So she said, I realized if I put this show on, everyone kind of relaxes and. That that felt to me like a bit of a, an illustration of of you know stepping away from something like Twitter, where it's it's always just stress, anger, outrage, controversy, and and looking at other more calming things. Yeah, yeah it just it just helps so much of of what I a tiny amount of what I was seeing on on Twitter did I need to see or was it useful to me in any way? Which is a shame because ten fifteen years ago. It was a fun way to, it really to sort was. of, you could get to know people, you could back and forth, you could, you could tease a friend on online and no one was going to get outraged by it. Right. It was a safer neighborhood. It's well, a shame in that respect. Yeah. You and I have talked on here before about uh, your experience with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries and obviously the debacle that was there in the revealing of really awful behavior. It seems as though we really don't go two or three weeks that we don't have some sort of some sort of revelation, actually, usually more of kind of a half revelation. And we saw that this week with pastor, prominent pastor Steve Lawson in Dallas. We don't exactly know exactly what uh, happened mm -hmm. there, but clearly some form of at least, of sexual immorality. And that's prompted a lot of people to start bringing up questions of, well, how do you keep that from happening? And so there, there are some people who are talking about the Billy Graham rule that uh, a man should never be alone in any way with a woman who's not his wife. And if you do that, that's going to reduce this. Other people who are saying, if you implement that, it doesn't stop this. It just uh, creates a deceptive way of, of uh, an even more deceptive way of going about this mm -hmm. kind of pursuit. And it, it presents women as sort of temptresses that, uh, that rather than, than co-laborers and, and joint heirs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, what, what do you think about, about that, about the, the sort of controversy that comes up in question that comes up about, well, how do we make sure that doesn't happen the next time? Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if there's one answer to that question, to be honest. We, we talk about it often here uh, as, a, as a leadership team. You could have all the best systems in place, but if you're determined to sin, you'll find a way of sinning. 
so much of it ends up being down to our self-control. We, we've often talked here about preferring the language of transparency to the language of accountability. Not that we don't believe in accountability, but transparency is a, a voluntarily letting you into my life. And so having people that we can confess our sins to, people who know what's really going on in our hearts, that, that matters a huge amount because I don't know that the details, of, as you just said, of the Stephen Lawson case and of so many others, I don't know the origin stories of some of these sins and whether whether there would have been a moment earlier on in the process where someone could have said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this at the moment, would you pray for me? Whether that might have actually helped someone not to persist in a sin or to escalate it to the point where it becomes so serious and so catastrophic. We're going through James at the moment in, in our church and James says in James 1 that the temptation gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown gives birth to death. Um, and it's just a reminder, there's, there's a moment when there's a temptation that hasn't yet become an actual sin, hasn't get yet given birth to sin. There's a moment when sin hasn't yet fully grown. And that there are various points along the way where we might have more ability to, to, to actually do something about the sin that we're tempted by or struggling with. Uh, mm. But once it becomes fully grown and starts to take over, it, it's going to be harder to, to step away from it. So transparency, I hope, means that it gives us more opportunity to confess things that need to be confessed in, their, in the earlier stages than in the before some of these habits become calcified and begin to, begin to escalate. How, how do you know with whom to be transparent? I mean, I think there are a lot yeah. of people, when they're grappling with something, they think, I don't want to be weird oversharer. But I also don't want whatever it is that I'm grappling with to to continue down that process you're talking about. So how do yeah. you know where to do that and with whom? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a wisdom issue. The Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another. James 5 tells us that. So there's no, there's no question about whether we should, but the question is how do we and, and who do we? I would normally default to either, if someone is starting starting that process, to think, well, who is a... Who is a trustworthy Christian friend who has the, the maturity either to not freak out or not to let me off the hook, mm -hmm. um, but will actually be a friend to me, a proper Christian friend to me in that disclosure? Or is there a, one of my church pastors or church leaders that I could talk to again who would have the wisdom and experience to, to respond in a, in a healthy and, and helpful way? Yeah, these things, you can't just blurt it out to anyone because some people are not going to be responsible or wise in how they, they respond to that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but we all need someone. Most of us need more than one <laughs> mm -hmm. that we can just be honest with about, about what we're going through. With so many of these scandals, uh, it, it always made me wonder, did they, did they have any really true Christian friendships in their life? How much were they having to keep people away from what they were really doing and what was really going on in their life. So yeah. two of the devil's biggest lies are you, you're the only one who struggles with this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and you can't tell anyone. Yeah. And, and sin thrives in that kind of dark secrecy. James says, if you confess your sins and, and pray for one another, there's healing in that. There's something, even just mm -hmm. in the putting it into words, putting it on the table, seeing it in the cold light of day, with with Christian friends, even even that step can bring a measure of healing. Yeah, I was uh, telling my uh, seminar that I teach at Emmanuel as we were going through the messages of of Jesus to the churches at the beginning of Revelation. I noticed that this call to repentance was not condemnation but invitation. Hmm. And around that same time, I just happened to think of a quote from Fleming Rutledge where she talks about the fact that God's grace so so comes before goes before us that when we when we get to that point of conviction of sin, often we misinterpret that as because I'm convicted of sin, that means that I need to step back from God. When in reality, at that moment, it's not that you are knocking at the door of grace, you're already standing in grace. Hmm. 
and that this this conviction is itself a grace of God that you're not mm. overwhelmed by something. And I find that is that that is so consistent with the text of Scripture and the and the person of Jesus. And it is so hard for people to get, including yeah. me. Yeah, I need to re-preach that to myself probably every day. But the idea that God bringing a sin to my attention in my heart is that's kindness. That's helping me be a healthier believer. The devil ac- accuses to condemn. Mm-hmm. Uh, the spirit convicts to point us to to Christ and, and repentance. Um, there's a positive outcome with the spirit's conviction. So yeah, I think that's a that's a that's a wonderful insight. It reminds me of the the Sinclair Ferguson book, The Whole Christ. And how repentance is is not the sort of the steps we have to take in order to then receive grace. Getting to repent is part of the grace. It's yeah. it's that's part of the good news. I get to repent. What a kindness that God allows us, gives us the opportunity to repent. Always love reading your writing and enjoyed reading this book as well, one with my Lord. Uh, you were inspired to write this book on a train platform at Paddington Station <laughs> in London. What happened to inspire you to write it? Uh, yes. So I was rushing to to get a connection. I'd been in London, was, was going to be traveling back out of London and was on one on the tube train. You had to run up the steps to Paddington find the platform to my next train, get on it. And I knew that, that it would be a tight connection. So I, I ran up the steps from the, the tube station, went to the big display screen where all the, the different trains and platforms are listed to tr- try to find out which platform my, my next train was going to be leaving from and realized <laughs> I had to get embarrassingly close to the screen to be able to read it. Um, mm. All the letters and numbers were, were blurry and I, that was my okay. I am actually middle aged, and my <laughs> eyes are now middle aged, and I need to I need to do something. So that was what propelled me to get my eyes tested, to get glasses. And when I then got the glasses, I realised not only can I now read the departure board at Paddington Station, but there's so many things that I didn't realise you could you were meant to be able to see clearly. Individual leaves are there. Yes, on the tree. yeah. So if I look out of the window now, because I don't have my glasses on, if I look out of the window and see the the greenery on the other side of the road, I can make out the shapes of the bushes, but I can't see the leaves. If I, if I was to put my glasses on, I'd be seeing it in HD and I'd, I'd be seeing everything in much sharper. I didn't know we were, supposed, <laughs> we were supposed to be able to see it that clearly. And I, I talk about that in the book because I had the exact same experience when it came to understanding this language in the Bible of being in Christ and how clarifying on so many things I hadn't realized I'd been living with a measure of unclearness about all of a sudden came into to, to focus. There was a lady who walked up to me this past week. I was speaking in uh, Nantucket, Massachusetts, and it was in a bookstore at the Moby Dick exhibit. Of course, Nantucket's connected uh, <laughs> there, and I, I, I love Moby Dick. And they had uh, every possible edition you could possibly ask and every book about the book that you could possibly ask. And this woman walked up and said hello and she said she said I'm a I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth hmm. which I thought was an interesting way to put it rather than saying I'm also a Christian or hmm. something like that she said I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth and I know there are a lot of people who like to use that language I'm a follower of Jesus because Christian has become so confusing to a lot of people, and it carries a lot of connotations that that they don't want to to embrace. And so they'll say, "I'm a mm. follower of Jesus." You talk about it in the book, actually, though both of those things are perfectly fine for for one to to think of as as one's identity. It's actually not the best way to think of ourselves. In the New Testament, how how would you better? Yeah, well, the but the better question is how is that as the New Testament better do it? So again, this is this was another a big revelation to me some years ago when I began thinking through this topic was the realization that our language is not the same language the New Testament uses to talk about our faith. Uh, we we primarily talk about being a Christian. Again, sometimes we might use a I'm a follower of Jesus kind of language. The word Christian only, I think, appears three times in the whole New Testament. And you would think in the book about the Christian faith, you know, the word Christian would be all over it. What is all over it, certainly all over the New Testament, is the language of being in Christ, in Him. 
or, or variations of that. So I realized the New Testament's primary way of talking about what it means to be someone who, who does follow Jesus is different to the language we typically use. And that's not a you say tomato, I say tomato thing. It actually means there's, a, there's something conceptually off if we're never using the language the New Testament uses and using language the New Testament only uses very little. Because the, the idea that I'm in Christ speaks to an immediacy, an intimacy that you don't always get with the language of I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of lots of things, mm-hmm. none of which implies, you know, I've got authors on Amazon that I follow because I want to know if they've got a new book out, but that doesn't imply any kind of proximity, certainly any kind of relationship. And you could theoretically be a follower of Jesus by trying to sort of do some of the things he did or obey some of the things he said without having a relationship with him. Mm. Whereas the language of being in Christ immediately, I know it, it's strange and unfamiliar, but it immediately shows us the, the Christian life is actually far more intimate. Jesus is much nearer to us than we tend to realize. If I keep reminding myself I'm I'm in him, it's it's not that he's a dot on the horizon I'm I'm never quite catching up with. This is his way of fulfilling his promise to be with us always to the very end of the age, because he's he's united himself to us. So once we see the Christian life in the light of that, so much falls into place and it's it's even better than we'd realized <laughs> because Jesus is not some far off inspiration that we will never get anywhere close to. He's he has drawn us so deep into his heart that we are now one with him. You talk about in the book that if if the Christian faith is like a house, that union with Christ is a load-bearing wall, and mm. that there are none of the other blessings are possible. I thought it was a, a powerful point that if you if you don't get that, everything else is kind of downstream from it. Yes, to mix up my metaphors here, <laughs> load-bearing <laughs> downstream, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I mean. We, we see that Paul says that I've got Ephesians 1 open in front of me. We've been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Mm. In Christ, we have all of those blessings. Apart from Christ, we have none of them. So I, I talk about it being a bit like the, the stocking that our Christmas gifts are found in. Those gifts come to us in the stocking. Because we have the stocking, we have all the things that come in it. Because we are in Christ, we have all the spiritual blessings that come through being in him. So it's it's not one discrete self-contained item that we we have alongside lots of other things it's it's the means by which we have all the blessings we enjoy as as believers and it's also true i think about in my own life there are so many things where i'm able to say to myself you can do this because you've done it before hmm. you've survived something like this before so this isn't completely strange unfamiliar territory and if we're in Christ and his life is our life and his life story is now our life story, that means that there are none of these things that we fear where we haven't been here before. I mean, we yeah. have been crucified with Christ. We have already faced death. Yeah, We have already been raised. We are already seated at the right hand of the Father. It changes and, and broadens out your entire sense of life. It does. We, we often use the language of the, the already and the not yet, what we already have, what we still await. I think one of the things this, this whole doctrine helps us really appreciate is the already is way better than I used to think it was. Mm-hmm. I already have far more than I realized in Jesus. And like you say, when you begin to, to, to really meditate on that, it, it takes a lot of, it doesn't, take all of our fears away, but it, it can really help us. The things that we, we typically worry about in life, I hope we can begin to worry slightly less about because because we're in Christ, because we've already died. Paul says, I no longer live. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so in one sense, all the worst things that might happen to us have already happened to us in Jesus in a way that's that's protected us. The great uh, Chris Christopherson, who died uh, just this week as we're recording this, Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And if you're if you're crucified outside the camp, you really have nothing left to lose. And if you are raised with Christ, you have everything. I mean, that's just yeah. so hard for for me to get anyway. It really is. I think I talk about this in the book. I, I was at the 
having my hair cut a lot long ago and had those usual sort of chit chatty conversations and the, the hairdresser said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I, I said, I'm a church pastor and I could see the sort of quick looking for the exit to this conversation, <laughs> look in his face. And he said, oh, I, 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 I believe in God as if that would kind of pat me on the head and make me happy. And then we could mm-hmm. talk about something safer. But the fact is it, because these blessings come by being in Jesus, actually being a monotheist doesn't necessarily help you. Cornelius believed in God and was an upright man, a well-regarded, charitable man. He was still unsaved until he, he came to saving knowledge of Jesus. So it does bring to, into sharp relief some of those questions where, you know, I know so many people who, who are trying to, to believe in God, and I keep wanting to say to them, well, put, just put that to one side. Look at Jesus. What do you think of him? Because it, it's Jesus we need to have belief in not just being a card-carrying monotheist of, of one type or another. I'm convinced more than ever that one of the primary issues, major issues of this time, is lifelessness and the boredom that comes with lifelessness. So mm-hmm. when we were talking earlier about kind of what has happened with social media, I think a lot of that quarrelsomeness is coming from a place of lifelessness and boredom. And that's that's able to inject some drama. And when you look at, for instance, porn, the issue with with porn is usually not that people are so highly sexualized, I guess. That's that's kind of the second step. It's that they're so mm-hmm. dead and bored that this is this is the way to give them this sort of temporary substitute for for life that of course doesn't hmm. doesn't do it but the sense of lifelessness it seems to me that's a major major problem right now including with people who are who who are christians and just don't know what it is to actually be alive or or to know that they're alive in christ yeah. Well, I think going back to another part of our conversation, I'm I'm sure that is one of the things that has led to these pastors getting into affairs and scandals. Again, is a, is a sense of emptiness or lifelessness within, and not if we all truly knew the life we really have now in Jesus, we w- we wouldn't be looking for for the sort of the counterfeit stimulants of the world around us. We would be so so thrilled at what we have in Him. That those things would just have no appeal at all. But I think this, I think, I hope this will help us nudge our, ourselves closer to an appreciation of what it means to find our lives in Jesus. It doesn't just mean we get a ticket to, to heaven and we can check the box that our eternal life kind of insurance policy is in, is in place. It means there's a way to live now that is real life. And it's life that is, is in Jesus, that is. Look, trying to look at the world through his eyes, trying to have the heart that he has, and there, there will be many things Christians go through. But no, no Christian should should truly be bored, um, mm-hmm. because we have life with our Creator, and we're seeing reality now in a totally different way. It's, it's. I was reading my. I only kept a diary during the year where I came to faith. I had mercy on the world and didn't continue it beyond that point. But I was reading through it recently. It was over just over 30 years ago I became a Christian. And that sense of wonder, actually it was a rebuke to me. I was thinking I should I should still have that sense of wonder. The world is now utterly fascinating in a way it might not have been beforehand. Mm. Because everything is tinged with extra meaning. So I say this as a not to, to moralize to other people, but just to remind myself I should I shouldn't be bored mm-hmm. if I really have life in Jesus. What about the person who's listening to this who would say the same thing, that they can look back in in their life and see a time when things did seem to be charged with the glory of God in a way, but now they feel lifeless, they feel dead, they feel distant from God. What should they do? There's, I'm sure, more than one right answer to this question, but the the thing that is top of my head is is the Psalms are such a gift to us. Mm. And the the longer I go on in the Christian life, the more I appreciate the Psalms, the more I can't imagine life without the Psalms, because the Psalms help us to navigate every conceivable experience we could be going through. And there are there are times when the psalmists are saying, God, you seem so far from me, and, and my prayers are like bouncing back off the ceiling, and everything that seems so real now feels so unreal. 
and they give us the language to put that feeling into words. They also help us respond to those feelings with with God's truth. God is so kind that not only <laughs> does he tolerate our spiritual ups and downs, but he, he gives us the language to use to come to him with, with our bewilderment, our exasperation, our doubts, our failing to understand who he is and what he's doing. So the Psalms would be a key thing. One of the other things I try and do for myself is to, whenever I'm picking up a bit of the, looking through a bit of the Bible, is to try to read it as if I'm reading it for the first time again. And not just go, yeah, 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 I know this, I know this, I know this, I've studied this text, but to, to think, okay, what, and I then just start to notice things, obvious things that I had actually missed the last few times of, of going through it. That helps being around believers who are stimulated by Jesus really helps. Sometimes that's being around a young, a young believer who is firing at all cylinders and I start to see the faith through their eyes again and rem- remember the wonder of it. Or it's just by being around other believers who are, again, they're, sh- they're showing me how to keep going with Jesus, even if I don't always feel it. Well, you mentioned the Psalms. One of the things we do on this show is uh, to assemble a desert island biblical <laughs> book list in which the question is, if you're going to be on a desert island for the rest of your life, you're not sure that you're going to retain your memory when you're there, and you can choose only five books of the Bible to take with you, what would they be? And I'm guessing so- the Psalms would be one of yours, right? Psalms would be one, not just because you get more more text for your money's worth. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that would be one, because it, again, that there won't be anything I'm experiencing that I can't use a Psalm to help me with. I would, I would probably pick the Gospel of Mark, the letter to the Romans, and I would take Genesis and that leaves one more. So probably Isaiah, because it's a, a big, a nice big fat prophet. Why Mark? Mark has always been my favorite gospel. So it, it's the one I, I think we all fall in love with, whichever is the first gospel that we look deeply at. Mark was the first gospel I ever really studied in depth. So it's always been my, amongst the gospels, my first love. So it's the one I come back to the most often. So yeah, that, that sort of, that's, that's the key of middle C in my kind of Actually, in my biblical canon, probably. And what about uh, a non-biblical book? You get one. I feel like I should say the complete works of Shakespeare, but that, that's just to sound like my reading is more sophisticated just than, than it really is. Signifying that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read Shakespeare for, for decades now. I would probably take a really good history book. I love reading history. I might take one of those fat books that I've tried to read and haven't successfully finished, but, and, and then that's that's a good opportunity to do so. I would take The Power Broker by Robert Caro, hmm. which I've I've dipped in and out of various times. Keep thinking I should read that cover to cover one day. I had it on, yeah, it's, it's one of those. <laughs> so many people say it's one of the best books ever written, and I've read sections of it, heard sections of it, so this would be a good time just to sit down and read it straight through. Well, the new book is One With My Lord, The Life-Changing Reality of Being in Christ by Sam Alberry. Check it out, and I think you will find it very helpful. Sam, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. It's produced by Will Dawson. The associate producer is Mackenzie Hill. This episode was mixed by Kevin Morris with video production by Abby Egan. Theme music by Lennon Hutton. Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper are the executive producers of CT Media Podcasts, and Matt Stevens is our senior producer. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review to help more people find the show. Thanks for listening.